Go ahead. Well, I'd like to uh, welcome everybody who's watching online at this time. So we're glad you're here with us, online at least. And um, our scripture reading for today's sermon is from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Corinthians 10 13. We, however, will not boast beyond measure, but within the limits of the sphere which God appointed us, a sphere which especially includes you. And the name of our title of our sermon today is Don't Tempt Me. And Pastor Colette, come on up and I'll pray for you. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for Pastor Colette. I pray right now for your Holy Spirit to be with our pastor and uh, bless the words, Lord, that come out of our, her mouth and uh, be with our ears and more especially with our hearts. Um, just speak to us, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. So I very carefully wrote out all this scripture slides so that you could see where I was heading and what, what verses I was using. That little thumb drive did not come with me this morning. Mm -hmm. So if I don't give you a reference, but you wonder where it came from, if you will email me, I will send you a copy that has all the references in it. Um, you know, sometimes your brain, I think, sometimes you just, I know exactly where it is, it's still plugged into the, my laptop at home. Okay, Psalm 46 verse 1 tells us, some of you may have this memorized, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Beth Moore uses an analogy of the will of God being a strong fortress, and when we are within the will of God, the enemy has no access to hurt us. If we are safely within those strong, unshakable walls of God's revealed will, the enemy has to just wait outside. But the doors are open and we have freedom to go across that guarded game plank and into the countryside beyond. And as soon as we're outside of God's will, we are vulnerable. We are vulnerable to be captured, to be tortured, and enslaved. So we are always free to make that choice and leave what we know God wants us to do and be. But we are not always free of the consequences once we leave His will. And those consequences sometimes can be very difficult and very, very painful. Our enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Anyone know that reference? John 10.10. 10. He comes to kill, steal, kill, and destroy. We live in a battleground. While it might be exciting to make our forays out into the, the world where the devil can have at us, the safest place in all the universe is within the fortress of God's revealed will. That we, if we, we can save ourselves so many trials and troubles if we just do what we know he says that we should do. We can be securely tucked behind the strong protective wall that is our loving Heavenly Father. And the devil has to get to us through him. He is this barrier of protection for us. 
Well, we've been slowly praying and learning to apply the Lord's Prayer as a template for our own daily conversation with our Heavenly Father. And so today we will unpack the phrase, lead us not into temptation. Well, there are two Bible passages that immediately come to mind when I read this. And the first is James chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, where James teaches, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So that sounds like temptation is not only from the enemy out there, it is also from within, by our own selfishness, our fallen human nature. Um, it begins down deep in the bowels of that fallen human nature. Okay, so that's one thing we need to consider when we pray, lead us not into temptation. God is not going to lead us into temptation, right? But the second verse to consider is Matthew 4, verse 1, where it says that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert. Why? To be tempted by the devil. So sometimes the spirit actually leads us into situations where the devil can have us. And we just go, why would God allow that? Why would God do that? Sometimes we will be in a place where the enemy can harass us. Why would God do it? Doesn't God love us? Doesn't he want to see us succeed and live our lives of Christian obedience? Okay, I would like to propose, my mouth is super dry today, I'm sorry. Um, I'd like to propose that God allows us to be tempted. Because for some of us, that's the only way we will realize how completely dependent we are on him for our strength and for our faith. He wants us to know our own weakness. He wants us to understand our own vulnerability. So we will press in close and have that relationship with him where he does the fighting, where he does the work to make sure that we are left with freedom. Um, Jesus taught in John 15 that without him, we can do nothing. do nothing, especially conquer temptation. If we try to fight in our own strength, I'm sorry, folks, but we're whooped. And it usually doesn't take very long if we're, we're going at fighting temptation in our own strength. God allows us to be tempted because he wants that tight, unbroken, constant communion with us. And when you're in the thick of a battle, you're always checking back in with the general to see where to be careful and what's going on. You need a bigger picture than your own perspective. And when we're in the thick of a battle, at least I know I tend to, to really lean harder into God for his power and strength when things are hard in my life. Many of us, unfortunately, go blissfully, blissfully through our own life, and if things are going well, we just are independently selfish, and we don't even consider how much we need God. God allows temptation when it can work for our good, and if he sees that it will teach us to walk with him in trust and humility, holding his hand. Well, sometimes God does lead us into, tempta into situations where we will be tempted. But he has a plan with what he's going to do. He's going to use those temptations either to help us grow or for us to be able to help someone else grow. 
even as we are in the midst of the struggle, the Bible teaches that God is still in control. He controls the pace, the frequency, and the intensity of the temptations that we face. And I know sometimes when you are really having a difficult, I actually have a water bottle that's back there with my other stuff. There you go. Thank you. Aren't you good? Um, the Bible teaches that um, God won't allow us to be tempted above that which we can bear. Anybody know what that one is? 1 Corinthians 10.13 and I gave you the wrong verse to read for scripture. It's supposed to be First Corinthians, not Second Corinthians. My bad. Um, so, although the devil does the tempting, God is sovereign. And God is the one who will either allow it or not allow it for what he knows about us, whether we will learn from it or whether we will be broken. And he lets temptations and trials come only if he sees the positive outcome that is possible. Luke 22, verses 31 and 32, teaches the same idea. Jesus had this to say to Peter before Peter denied him, and the rooster crowed three times, you remember the story. He said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you. Notice, Satan has to ask. Satan has to ask before God gives him access to have at us. And notice also that when Jesus knew that Satan was after Simon, Jesus did the praying. He prayed for Simon in his temptation. And so if you are having just this wave of temptations that just seem horrible and overwhelming, remember that you have a high priest Amen. whose name is love, who stands before the Father's throne. And if he's allowing you to be tempted, he is also praying that you will come out through that temptation on the right side, glorifying him. I just That just really helps me. That the, the more that's coming my direction that's hard and negative, the harder I know Jesus is praying for me at the Father's throne above. So, why then is Jesus teaching us to ask him not to be tempted? That's a really interesting question. If we know that he's already controlling our temptations, and if we know that he's not the one tempting us, but the devil is, why does Jesus say, lead us not into temptation? as a model of what we are to pray every day. Could it be that Jesus wants us to have the daily awareness that we will be facing temptations? And sometimes we have temptations we don't even recognize because it's been, become such a normal part of our life that we just do it and it's not God-honoring and it doesn't even register. So, he wants us to be completely aware that there will be temptations. And in the morning, he wants us to power up and focus in on Jesus so when those temptations do come, we're going to fight in his strength and not our own. Mm -hmm. We're going to let him do the fight if we've done that as we've had our prayer time in the morning. You have to remember that watch and pray are always linked to facing temptation. Jesus says it many, many times, and Paul says it many, many times. If you're facing something difficult, watch and pray. So prayer is our weapon, and the Word is our weapon when we are faced with hard things. Perhaps lead us not into temptation is included in the Lord's Prayer to urge us every single day to pray for God's strength. Because we know that with, 
without a doubt we will be tempted. It's not if, it's when. Right? We don't have a choice about it. We're humans and we live on planet Earth. This battlefield. Perhaps lead us not into temptation is our little trigger to pray, I know I'll be tempted today, Lord Jesus. Help me depend on you. Help me to be so focused on your grace that I will honor you when I have to face the stuff coming at me. When I was in high school at Auburn Academy, Miss Judy Toop was my favorite teacher. And it has been such a joy to reconnect with her as she's a really good friend of Joyce Johnson. And she often worships with us, not this last year, of course, because she's Canadian. So she can't even come at this point. But she has been a frequent guest in this congregation. And I loved Miss Toop for many reasons. Partially because I love biology and I found the subject material she was presenting to be just wonderful, fascinating. And partially because when she made up her seating charts, she always sat me beside the young man I had a crush on. <laughs> what a good teacher. <laughs> and partially because she gave pop quizzes. Now I know you were thinking, I must have been a true nerd <laughs> to appreciate pop quizzes. And I have to confess, I was a nerd. <laughs> when my mom would drop me back off at the dorm after home leave, she would always say the same thing. Don't study so hard. Have fun every day. And don't be afraid to get into trouble. <laughs> what kind of a mother says those kind of things to her teenage daughter? The mother of a nerd. And, you know, I needed to be reminded to live a little bit and not be quite so uptight about my grades. But back to YouTube's pop quizzes. Up to three times a week on a random schedule, she would quiz us on the reading from the night before or on the main ideas from the lectures that had just been in the preceding days. And you know, I never even thought of skipping class or not doing my reading because I knew that pop quizzes happened. I knew it wasn't if, it was when it was going to come. Now here's the part that I loved about Miss Tube's quizzes. There was a never a question on the test that hadn't already been on the quiz. If you learned it consistently, day by day, you had good study habits. You could pull out all of those quizzes that had been graded and returned, and you could ace the test. 100% score was not impossible because she had slowly built you up to succeed. Miss Two taught for mastery, and she gave us every incentive to develop great study habits instead of just cramming when the final was coming. She didn't give us quizzes to see us fail. She gave us quizzes to help us succeed. And isn't that just a wonderful idea? And can it be that the Lord allows us to be tempted not to see us fail, but to see us succeed? To give us the knowledge of either His strength and grace, if we succeed, or of our own weakness, if we don't, that He gives us, He allows these temptations so that we will truly be self-aware and God-aware of where the strength is going to come from. Well, exactly the same Greek word, and I'm just going to put it up there for you, describes both tests and temptations. Did you know that? A test and a temptation in Greek looks exactly the same way. Tests and trials are pressures from without. Temptation are desires that are pushing from within. Okay? But it's exactly the same. It still is a pressure that's going to help us with that self-awareness 
or not. Parasmos connotes trouble or something that breaks our happy little life, our pattern of peace and comfort and joy, and begins to call us to understand what is really going on. Trials rightly faced are harmless and beneficial to the believer. Do you believe that? And I was going to show you, and I'll, I'll quote it here, James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, where James says this, Consider it, what? Pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance, and perseverance must finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So do any of you want to be mature and complete? Oh, yeah. So, you know what that means? How's he going to get you there? Through trials and temptations, right? That's how he's going to get you to mature and complete. But, this is one of those days. Um, but exactly the same trials, the same situations, if they're coming at you and you're not watching and praying, they become temptations. They become an invitation for resentment, an invitation for depression, an invitation for hostility, an invitation for gossip. Those same trials and to become temptations if we don't submit and pray, watch and pray. Amen. So it's watching and praying that can leave those pressures out there instead of in here. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So think of yourself as a tube of spiritual toothpaste. Are you pressed or cold? <laughs> Your pressure is what brings out what's really on the inside. The word parasmos came to sick signify intentional testing with the purpose of discovering what was really in there. Was it good or evil, power or weakness in a person or thing? Well, about six weeks ago when I was seriously thinking about losing my job and swim, I started to look online for part-time work. And one job opportunity really looked like I could do it. I could, in the safety of my own home, on my own schedule, press test prototypes of small appliances. Now, I'm on my fourth Cuisinart, because I use it that often. And I thought, I can do this. I can test these small appliances. The pay was really good, like 25 an hour. And I, I, if you use them repeatedly, and you clock that how long you use them before finding something breaks. Then you submit your report, you, the records of both the time and the failure mode. Now, I have broken most of my appliances in my 36 years of marriage, so I think I was a really qualified applicant. I'm also good at keeping records, so I thought, I can do this. So I would report back to the manufacturers so that they then could give it back to the engineers for a do-over. Something needed to be tweaked, something needed to be strengthened, something needed to be refined in the design. I wish they had done that with the ice machine on our refrigerator. <laughs> so what these manufacturers really want is to see if it would fail and where it would fail but not so the small appliance would be a failure, so it could be remedied, so it could be fixed. Mm -hmm. If we see temptation and trials in that light, God is just trying to figure out how to get us to understand where we are potentially broken, given the right set of circumstances. And when we figure that out, what he wants is for us to repent and confess 
and lean in hard so that tendency to evil can be fixed, can be strengthened with the strength of God. So, we all have flaws. If you want to know mine, just ask Mark. But these flaws are not God's design. Do you remember what he said when he created us? Male and female created he them, and then three verses later it said, God saw everything he had made, and it was good. not just good. Very good. Very good. When God made us, he made us very good. But we now have 6,000 years of inherited human nature. It is completely written into our DNA to sin, to be selfish, to depend on ourselves, to be fiercely independent. We grew up watching our parents. And did any of you have parents that were sinners? Yeah. Yeah? If you had parents that were sinners, you learned to sin by watching them, unfortunately. And then our friends came along and they had a whole new set of sins that we could learn from our friends. And then we turn on either our TVs or our computers, and the media gives us even more. And it's all just bombarding our brain, and we're just saying, okay, but I want to be like Jesus. We have to be aware, first of all, what are our own personalized temptations. You know, the devil is so smart. He has studied human psychology for 6,000 years. He has studied you every day of your life. He's seen what, what really perks you up and what grinds you down. He sees when you fail and when you succeed. He's got all of this in his database. And you know what? The devil gives you exactly the temptation that's going to bring you down. Doesn't that just sound horrible? To know what that you are facing an enemy that's that strategic? He field tests temptations in our lives, and then he recycles the ones that work best. And probably the same temptations that you struggled with at age 20. Anybody want to admit there's still the temptations that you struggle with now? Or do you have a new set? You have a new set. That's good. And somewhere along the way, sin morphs from something that we just do in a while, once in a while, to a power that completely enslaves everything we do. It's sin with a capital S. Like it takes on a life of its own. And, and it's horrible. Oh, wretched man that I am, Paul said, who will deliver me from this body of death? And you know what the next verse says? Thank God it has been done. Thank God it has been done through Jesus Christ our Lord. So God doesn't test us because he wonders what our failure mode will be. Psalm 139 says he knows what we're going to say even before we say it. He knows when we're going to sit down and when we're going to rise up. He knows everything about us. But God tempts, tests us so that we will become self-aware and really know ourselves. That we'll know what's going to trip us up. And we can start making a strategy that might help next time. You know, it's like Mark never takes, he never took the young teenage girl babysitter home. He didn't want to be tempted. He didn't want to be accused. It's always my job. Mark gives the Bible studies to the men. I give the Bible studies to the women. You begin to just say, I'm going to put up some safeguards because I know this is a place where I might be vulnerable. Okay? So, as you're aware of where your failure mode is going to be, you start talking to him about it and you ask him for wisdom. In fact, that passage from James 1 that says, you know, 
consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds, you know what the next verse is? So that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And then the next verse says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives liberally, without scolding, and it will be given. The context is facing trials and temptations. That if you need wisdom to know how to face whatever it is that's coming at you, God promises he'll help you figure it out. He is smarter than the devil even. Mm -hmm. Do we believe that? Mm -hmm. He's smarter. And he can take what the devil intends for harm. He can take what the devil intends to ruin us and turn it on its head if we will just completely press in and depend on him and ask for wisdom as we go through it. We are stronger at the end of our temptation than we were at the beginning. And I just love that. We would be helpless and lost without his love. And so the act of revealing our true condition to us is actually love. He gives us this self-awareness because we desperately need it. So he's not going to wait until Judgment Day to say, Ah, you're selfish. Ah, you're lazy. Ah, you're mean. He does not do that. Instead, he gives us lots of little opportunities along the way to discover those things about ourselves and to find our needs and to ask for not only forgiveness, but cleansing. If we never faced a temptation, we would not know who we really were. So he gives the enemy of our souls permission to get us at our weakest spots in our character. We can learn from experience that life doesn't work depending on ourselves. It gets messy way too fast. We can get sucked in with pain and brokenness and addiction. And when the enemy sees us sinning, he goes, hurry, I've got this one. Which is why I sent Janella the picture of the mouse and the mouse trap. Did that give you a clue what we were talking about today? The devil baits us, and then he, he just celebrates when we're caught. But what he intends for our destruction, Jesus comes along and springs a trap. And then he says, now stay close to me. Now follow me even closer than you've been. And I'll make sure you don't get into another one of those. Let me tell you how. And then he helps us. Falling into temptation does not snatch us from our Father's grasp. Okay? Getting caught in the trap is not the end of the story. Because there is grace. There is forgiveness. There is cleansing and there is power given to those who have failed. So when you find yourself trapped, don't despair. What do you do instead? You just cry for help. And when you cry for help, He shows up he springs the trap, he sets you free, and then you're going to hold on a little tighter because you've had that experience. This is what Jesus said in John 10, verses 27 and 28. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. So, a temptation that succeeds with you is not the end of the story. God's deliverance of you out of that temptation is the end. Well, so, if we flunk Miss Troop's daily quiz, we get to take it again, and again, and again. And when we have flunked a whole string of tests, we will finally cry out for help. 
And that's exactly what God has been waiting for. He's waiting for us to say, I am a mess. I am an addict. I am a sinner and I can't help it no matter how hard I try. Help me. And then he says, I thought you'd never ask. Okay, here I go. Where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. And so this is what he does when we find ourselves recently sprung from that mousetrap. He sends us the Holy Spirit to be a private tutor, to tell us the wisdom that we need to not get trapped again. He leads us to the specific commands and the specific promises in his word that will fortify our soul with truth and supplies. He sends us Christian friends who will encourage us. And he sends us accountability partners that we actually say, I'm having a problem with this. Can I talk to you about it like on a weekly basis so that you can help check this behavior that I do not want to continue? It could be eating. It could be drinking. It could be pornography. It could be gossip. When you realize that the devil has trapped you repeatedly in the same pattern, go for help. Ask God for help and ask your brothers and sisters in Christ also for help. He gives us scripture that helps us prepare for spiritual battle. And then after the battle, he gives us music and nature and long naps to restore our depleted souls because we will be spiritually exhausted. He strengthens our faith and he deepens our dependence. And it's all the result of us facing a trial, whether or not we succeed. Um, I read once of a woman who told God that she had sinned too much and she had ruined his plan for her life. You know God's response? He laughed. Mm -hmm. He said, oh my child, you're not that strong. <laughs> we are in the grasp of a God who's not going to let go. We are in the grasp of a God who has committed heaven and earth to get us through. And when we blow it, we just need to wait for him to come and spring our trap. And to keep on walking even more closely to him. So, we have a Savior who went head to head with the enemy. He went into the desert to be tempted. He went to Gethsemane, where he was tempted so greatly that he sweat drops of blood. Tempted to back out and give up on this mission to save us. He struggled and he struggled and he faced Every single temptation that you or I will ever face, every one, but he never once failed. Mm -hmm. He never once got caught. He never once gave in. Hebrews chapter 2, 17 and 18 tells us, For this reason he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the service to God that he might take, make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted. How does the verse finish? He is able to help those who are tempted. That's the promise. God knows. Jesus gets it. How hard life can be sometimes. He overcame every single temptation and then he gave his life as a substitute to pay for all the temptations that we didn't overcome. He could make atonement for our sins because he didn't give in and he didn't give up. Instead, he gave his life. He gave himself. That's why he's such powerful help while we're being tempted. It's because he gave it all so this temptation would not be the final word about who we were. His love for us is the final word in who we are. When he intercedes for us before the Father, 
he takes his own perfect life and he stretches out his hands and he says, my blood, my blood, to his father. And his father says, okay, go get her. You're going to bring her back to me. It's okay. I accept your sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Romans 5, 19 tells us that just through the disobedience of one man, Adam, many were made sinners, then also through the obedience of the one man, many will be made righteous. Okay, that's gospel truth. Understand it. Understand it when you are caught in that trap and you've blown it again. Just call for help, and he's going to apply his own merits. It's wonderful. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 5 tells us that temptation is not sin. Isn't that good news? Just because it's coming at you doesn't mean that your relationship with God has been broken. It says that Jesus was tempted more than anybody else in all points like as we are. Now, I have a different temptation than you. And you all have different temptations. But it says Jesus was tempted by all of them. Tempted in every way. So how can we expect that we'll be exempt? That we'll get through this life without ever having to face it? But because we know that Jesus understands temptation, we can approach God's throne. And there's a word I love here. In Hebrews chapter 4, it says we can come boldly. We can go for help in time of need because of what Jesus has done. Because of the fact that Jesus gets it. He understands temptation. And as we go boldly to the throne of grace, it says that we may obtain mercy and grace to help in time of need. What is the time of need? While well, we're being tempted. We find the grace to help in time of need. Or maybe it's grace to help in time of need after we've been tempted and we're caught in the trap. And we just need to be reminded that he still loves us. That he's not finished yet. The story's not over. 1 Corinthians 10.13 is an amazing promise when we are faced with trials and temptation. And the Greek word is exactly the same one as, as is used in the Lord's Prayer. Parasmos. It says, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted above what you can bear. Yeah. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. At the heart of this verse is the phrase, God is faithful. Okay, say that with me. This is the most important part of the sermon. God is faithful. God is faithful when you are tempted to give you another option. To give you the option that you could never do in your own strength. That you could only do in His strength. He gives you the option of applying faith to your daily personal circumstances and coming through with victory. Some people claim that this means that he will never give you anything more than you can handle. Have you all found that to be true? Mm -hmm. But have you ever hit a wall and you were given something you couldn't handle? You found your way out, you're still here, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is, does not mean that God knows that we're wimps, and so he's going to carry us around on a soft pillow and make sure nothing distresses us. He won't give you more than I can handle. So nothing bad's ever going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. No, this means whatever is coming at you, in his strength, he can handle it. Amen. And we get to hold on to him and go along for the ride. Mm -hmm. It's not about how much we can handle. It's about how much he can handle. Mm -hmm. And he's not letting go. He's not going to let go of you just because you te you're tempted whether or not you have victory, he's not letting go. 
Yes, God knows our weaknesses and our capacity, but he often lets us fail because he wants us to grow up. He wants to stretch our capacity. He wants to see us become mature and complete, not lacking anything. And so he allows us stuff to come at us. Even though we might be, not be quite ready, it's going to be a growing experience. Well, here we have Danny. <laughs> I, I can tell them the story I told you about Mark's mom. My mother-in-law, Mark's mom, was a three-pack-a-day smoker. So was her husband. So you can imagine how much secondhand smoke Mark still has in his system. And Mark's mom tried repeatedly to quit. We inherited her journals when she died. And throughout these journals, about every six weeks or so, is her declaration that she's going to quit smoking. And of course she never did. Broken resolutions as she tried and tried again. But... Her neighbor had given her a great controversy, which she did not read, but she put on her highest shelf. And then one day when she was sick and she couldn't get to the library, she pulled it down and began to read it. And as she came to understand the power of God, she said, I can go to this church and I can find power. Power to live my life. And so she started taking Bible studies. And when the health message was presented, she and the Bible worker that was studying with her earnestly prayed that she would be delivered from this terrible habit. She drove home, and she announced to Mark and her husband that she had just quit smoking. Guess what they did? They laughed at her. They had seen her try before. But the days went by, and then the weeks, and then the months, and she never picked up another cigarette. Mm -hmm. Because she had God's power now to fight that temptation. And Mark was 20 years old, and he's watching this, and he had to concede the truth. She had quit smoking, and it was the power of God. Mm -hmm. Because her own attempts had never worked. Mm -hmm. It was that first glimmer of faith that led to Mark's conversion. Mm -hmm. Amen. That he had seen his mother struggle and fail, right. and then in God's strength he had seen her after mm -hmm. Okay? And then he said, there must be a God. I guess I'll take Bible studies too. Mm -hmm. And the rest is history. If God only gave us temptations we could handle without his help, we wouldn't need him, mm -hmm. and we would give him no glory. Psalm 50, verse 15 says, Call upon me in the day of trouble. I love this. I will deliver you, mm -hmm. and you will honor me. That's what Mark's mom did. She called upon him. He delivered her. And then her own testimony and her cigarette-free hands uh -huh. honored him and told the world how strong he was. So instead, God allows us sometimes to be backed against the wall and facing these hopeless situations. So we will not only find our knees, we'll be face down on the floor in front of him saying, I need help. I cannot do this. You've got to do it. You have to do the fighting for me because I just can't. And that's when it's wonderful. It says, with the temptation, he will make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know what the way of escape is? Is it a fire escape? <laughs> is it some kind of stop smoking problem? program, a stop sinning program, 12 steps, what is the way of escape? All of those things are a good idea. This is what I have to say in my own life. I could name a thousand ways that God has helped me overcome temptations. Scripture, 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 and more scripture, right? And you memorize it so when the devil comes at you, you just throw it back at him. That's what Jesus did. Scripture, 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 and more scripture, right? 
agonizing prayer and a lot of tears. Lots of alone time in my garden. I told someone that I go into the garden when I'm struggling. And if you saw my garden, you'd realize how much I struggle. <laughs> you know? You just, alone time for me, where I can just connect with him and become grounded again that his love is unconditional. A good long talk with a godly friend. A small group that we check in with each other and pray for each other. A glimpse of eternity and a long view about what really matters. And then scripture, 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 and more scripture. A song with words that touch my heart and then lingers in my head for weeks. Those songs sometimes are my very best defenses against the devil the devil in his ways. Scripture, 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 and more scripture. The harder that the devil comes at you, the more you desperately need the word of God. Use it. Learn it. Not just read it, but memorize the very things that you're going to need. You know where he's gotten you already. Memorize the appropriate verses. But then I looked carefully at 1 Corinthians 10.13. There is a definite article. It says, and God will provide a way, not plural, not many ways, but a way of escape. And you know what that way is? Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the light. If you come to me, I will welcome you into my stronghold. And I will fight for you. He is the way of escape. All the other ways to escape are just little gifts that he gives us. So we can think that we're doing something. You will never successfully navigate a temptation without Jesus. Not even something small like a cookie or a bag of chips. And if Jesus is the way of escape, that's really wonderful news. Because where is Jesus? In our hearts. So everywhere we go, he's already there. You always have your defense kit available when the fight begins. He's always there with you. My friends, God's unfailing love for you is not dependent on your victory over temptation. But probably your happiness and your joy and your positive witness probably will be dependent to a degree or so whether you can say my God is able he is able to make me what he wants me to be God is not only faithful in providing a way out of temptation if we fail he is also faithful and just to what? Forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's faithful before we face the temptation. And if we don't get it right, he's faithful after the temptation. Because he teaches for mastery. And he's going to give us another shot at it. When we are too tired, when we feel so broken and so much of a failure to hold on to him, the Bible says, I hold you. He says, with my righteous right hand, I will hold on to you. None of us in this room would have a chance of heaven if our very first response to temptation was a final break in the judgment. Because we've all blown it. You know, I could not list how many times. We've all been given these do-overs again and again and again. But that just makes our testimony when we do have victory even more compelling. Like Mark's song. When we have failed and then we have victory, it's so evident it wasn't us. It was him. Mm -hmm. When we finally see Jesus and we cast our crowns at his feet, we will know without a doubt it was his victory. That he was the one who was at work in us to will 
and to do his pleasure. One last story. The missionary book, The Hidden Price of Greatness, tells of missionary to China named Gladys Aylward. Anybody read? Oh, okay, Destiny knows this woman. When the Japanese attacked her orphanage, she could run for her life, but she could not protect her 100 orphans that she was responsible for. She had to lead these little ones over a dangerous mountain pass to safety. During Gladys', Gladys harrowing journey out of war-torn Yangcheng, she wrestled with despair. She did not see a way through. After passing a sleepless night, she faced the morning, thinking that they were all going to die. And then a 13-year-old girl in the group, who had been there her whole life and taught by Gladys, reminded her of the much-loved story of Moses and the Israelites crossing the Red Sea. But I am not Moses, Gladys cried in desperation. Of course you aren't, said the girl. But Jehovah is still God. Yeah. And he is faithful. <clears throat> he is faithful. When you face impossible situations, he is still God. And if you can trust him, he will show you the way out. He will show you the way through. He will deliver you and you will. That's such good news. So lean in hard, pour your heart out toward him, and he will hold you fast. Listen to the words of this song.